All right. Welcome to Rich Conversations. We have another fantastic episode with another fantastic guest. Today we have Bryce Gunning, who's a marine biologist, and he's joining us from Vancouver Island. Is that what you said? Yeah, correct. Yeah, Vancouver Island. Pacific Northwest, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. Um, Abs- I'm really absolutely. excited to be on the show here and, you know, hopefully spark some passions among your listeners into marine biology and hoping we all can be a bunch of fish nerds together, you know, in the future <laughs> here. So why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, you know, it's always what a tricky question that is. Hey, you know, <laughs> very vague. It should be the, the easiest to answer, but it's always the hardest because, you know, you want to be humble. You want to say all your accomplishments. Um, but my name is Bryce Gunning. Uh, I'm a marine biologist uh, from Vancouver Island. Uh, I'm also a beach bum, uh, you know, mango margarita enthusiast, um, a giant fish nerd, um, and an amateur uh, bocce ball player. You know, you know, I just like, I like the Butachi on the the beach coast, you know, here, but uh, I'm 27. Uh, You know, I, I grew up on Vancouver Island with my family here. Um, However, our roots run deep in the Edmonton cold winters. Um, And so we ventured off to the, the Cayman Islands every winter to avoid it. And so that's where, uh, that's where my marine biology really sparked is with my mom who used to live down there teaching diving. And so she always ventured down there for Haven during the cold Edmonton winters. And, uh, that's where, you know, I was a beach bum, you know, four years old. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of a, a brief overlook at my professional life, um, in the marine biology sector, but yeah, it's a pretty simple one. Yeah. So what exactly is marine biology? And uh, well, you kind of mentioned it before, but what sparked your interest in pursuing it? Yeah. So marine biology is a huge field of science. It's everything to do with, you know, marine and biology being the study of life. And so my focus is large pelagic ocean animals. And so that's animals that are in the open ocean. So when you think of animals that are just migrating north to south or south to north, So for instance, sea turtles, whales, sharks, um, large schools of fish, that's my, uh, that's really my passion. And so that's my area of marine biology, but marine biology can be anything. It could be, you know, seaweed to larval fish. It could be studying the giant leatherbacks or the schooling hammerheads. It's really what you're interested in, which is why I love marine biology so much is there's so much to, to explore and to look at and we know more about the moon than we know about the bottom of the ocean. Like it's, it's crazy to me to think that we've been to space yet we don't know what's at the bottom of our own planet. And uh, that's what really sparked me as a kid is saying there's so much adventure, there's so much unknown. And yeah. you know, in a day and age where we all have computers in our pockets yet, there's still very juvenile questions of what is down there. Yeah. And I think that's super interesting. Um, Now, for me, I'm looking more at the conservation side of things where let's keep all these fish around to support our uh, human population here. But I think the exploration part of marine biology is really interesting. So marine biology is basically life having to do with water or in water, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long winded way of me saying that I'm a giant nerd when it comes to ocean related (laughs) activities. But yeah, it's, it's just the study of life underwater whether that be in the ocean, rivers, lakes, streams, those are freshwater biologists, but it's, it's relatively the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So what, what do you enjoy studying most in marine biology? Uh, you know, that's such a huge question. It's like saying, you know, what do you think about when you're about to go to sleep? Cause <laughs> I what I really enjoy with marine biology is just the ambiguous nature of it about how we can have great whites that travel from California all the way up to Alaska for, and we don't know the reasons. We can have a general yeah. idea, but do we really know what, what they do? We still in 2021 don't know where whale sharks give birth. We, we have Google really? earth, we have GPS locations, we have tags on them. We still don't know the exact position where they give birth. It's 2021, man. You know, I, I can get, 
you know, anything done anytime I can get Amazon to deliver a full bed in two days to my house. <laughs> yeah. We don't know where this whale shark's giving birth. It's like I said, it's crazy to me. And so that's what really sparks my passion is this, this mystery that's out there still. So how many, how many mysteries are actively on your mind? When it comes- oh man, I'm just laying in bed for hours, just thinking about, Oh, I wonder about that. I wonder if there's a paper. And then you go down that rabbit hole, kind of like if you're on TikTok or Instagram, but with scientific papers being like, Oh, do they look at that though? <laughs> um, I know. Yeah, I, you are. So, <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I got to wear it on my sleeve though. Right. Well, you're um, wearing it on your shirt. You got a, you're yeah. wearing a, a short sleeve collared shirt with fish on it, right? Is that what it this is? The tropical life right here. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to stand up and show you my slippers, but yeah, this is, this is the life that I'm living currently. I was hoping there was video involved because I wore this for nothing yeah. if there wasn't. Right. You right. Know? It looks like Just you have a whiteboard with in the background with some fish drawn on yeah, it. Yeah. Don't worry record. about that. All right. No, <laughs> <laughs> forgot to erase some stuff earlier, you know, just daydreaming. <laughs> Some active Uh, mysteries, though, in my mind, you know, it's one of the things that we know about baby fish, juvenile, larval fish, um, that kind of sector is that they die, that 99% of baby fish die. That's what we know about them. When you're that small, water feels like syrup. And so it's Mm. very easy to get caught by any other fish that's a little bigger than you. And so it's such a mystery that, yeah, a fish, like a lionfish can have 40,000 babies. But then you go to the Caribbean where they're invasive and they're all alive. You have so many lionfish. So how did these really? babies survive this treacherous? What I like to think about is, you know, with sea turtles are a great example. You know, sea turtles, they lay a bunch of eggs knowing that most of them are going to die. Yeah. Well, imagine that now on a thousandth of scale with fish knowing Uh, that most of them are going to die. And yet, you know, invasive species find this niche that they be prolific. And so I think that's a super interesting mystery. Like how can they just know that there's a niche there that they can fill that they know that you're saying, you're saying these are, you said lionfish. Yeah. Lionfish. Yeah. In the Caribbean, they're this invasive species of fish. They're a Pacific ocean fish. But yeah, you said they're from the Pacific ocean, but they made their way somehow to the Caribbean. Exactly. Another mystery that we have to ponder late at night at 11 (laughs) o'clock. Right. I was just about to ask you. So how how do you think that happens? Yeah. How do we know? Interesting though. Yeah. Okay. So it gets, it gets to the other side. Yeah. So the, the reason the, the thought behind how they got over, it was either aquariums were releasing lionfish that they had housed in Miami and Florida, sorry, Florida area aquariums, or it came in on boats. Just the larval fish came in on the villages and uh, on the on the boats there. And like I said, though, it's just crazy about how this fish that has predators and is part of the whole ecosystem of the Pacific is now in the Caribbean, just running the show. No predators. You know, they can have babies every, I think, four days. (laughs) And it's just it's decimating the reefs down there. And so a lot of um, money is going towards culling or spearfishing them out of the waters. Yeah, how, just, how big do these fish get? Uh, they're pretty big. They you said lion, big, you know? so I guess yeah. they're named after something big. Yeah. Well, yeah. So they're named lion because actually, you know, here we go. Nothing in my hands. They kind of look like this with their pectoral fins out. They're, they're, uh, uh, I feel like fins. I've seen them. Definitely. They're super popular in aquariums, which is where there's such an issue with um, releasing them without any um, causation but yeah so these lionfish are also venomous and so no one wants anything to do with them no Mm. predators no nothing because you know they're not built for it the predators don't know what they are it's like Mm. showing you a fruit and saying eat it well how do i eat this fruit though yeah do i have to cut it open like oh and apparently it's going to kill me if i eat it the wrong way right and so for predators down in the caribbean that's a that's a big issue is they don't know how to go about it. But the predators in the Pacific know exactly what to do. What's, what's even crazier is that the predators in the Pacific, they have, they're related to the predators down in the Caribbean. So a grouper is a great predator for a lionfish. Okay. Yet groupers in the Pacific can eat them, but groupers in the Caribbean have never seen them and don't know that they can eat them. So it's, wow. it's quite the conundrum. It really is. But isn't nature funny that way about how they can find a small little opening in a place yeah. they've never been and exploit it? Life finds it's, a way. 
life always finds a way. Isn't that interesting though? I, anyways, that's one of the many mysteries, you know, how invasive animals um, displace other species. Wow. How many fish species are there? 39,000. 39,000. Top of my head. No idea if that's accurate, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it is because I said it so confidently around that <laughs> 34 to 39,000 fish. Um, I would love uh, your viewers to fact check me. So there it's more interactive, okay. you know, of a we podcast. don't have live <laughs> fact checkers. We're, we're not, no, we're good. not at that point yet. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm glad this I can be on it. This what is this? A hundred and what what number of podcasts for you is this? Uh this will be in like the probably like 180s. Yeah. 190s. I'm so disappointed I'm not 69, dude. No reason. But <laughs> we're beyond family that show. right now. Yeah, family show. Sorry. Okay, so you've where has marine biology taken you around the world? So it's a really interesting, that's a really interesting question. I knew from four years old what I wanted to be. And it's really tough because growing up, you have all your friends being like, ah, my dad's a plumber, or I want to work on cars, or I really want to study dinosaurs or software. Mm -hmm. um, but they change their minds as they grow, as people do. They change their, oh, that would be interesting. Oh, I want to make a video game instead. Oh, no, actually, I like to go into beverages and bartending. Yeah. For me, I knew exactly what it was from four years old to wow. right this second. I've always known what I've wanted to do. And so it's never been a question. Like, it's just how to do it, how to get there. And so, like I mentioned prior, my mom was a scuba dive instructor when I was growing up. And so I would see all these photos of her on dive magazines and, you know, holding moray eels and with sharks in the <laughs> background. And, you know, as a kid, that's your, you know, your parents are your first idols. And so that just made it even easier for me to visualize myself in that position, um, mm -hmm. but more of an academic point of view. Okay. And so growing up, I would visit the Cayman Islands every winter, like I said, growing up in Edmonton until I was six years old. And eventually it just became like, okay, where's our next adventure going to be? How can we incorporate scuba diving in it? For my uh, eighth birthday, I woke up really early because my mom took me to our public pool here and put me in a scuba, you know, BCD, put a scuba tank on my back because that's as young as you can be. And so for my eighth birthday, 7.30 a.m., I was underwater. Wow. So it's been lifelong. Like you, you cannot find a harder worker uh with marine biology in the world you, you got the right one by dming me good but it's um so that was eight years old and then we took trips down to hawaii like to the islands there i did a bunch of diving as a 12 and 14 year old um i learned the safety aspects of diving how things can go wrong how serious of a sport it is you know it's not just like playing soccer and twisting the ankle this is life or death sometimes yeah and then you add animals right? That's just you by yourself. And then you add animals and animal behavior and animal interactions and ecosystems. Um, however, for, I'm sure you can relate to in high school, you know, you want a car, especially as a dude, you want a car, you want to impress the ladies or whoever you're, you're interested in. And for me, I was like, man, you know, we got the green seafoam station wagon. I'm hoping for my 16th birthday. You know, I get that, get the keys finally. Yeah. I was opening up my 16th birthday present, open it up, and there's just a dinky globe in it. Just a globe, like a, a globe that you spin, kind of yeah. thing, right? I'm like, well, what the? You know, I'm not a spoiled kid, but I'm like, yo, where are the keys at? You know? And and she said something that will forever stick with me and something that I will for sure do with my kids. And she said, pick anywhere you want and we'll go. And that was her gift to me, was a trip anywhere in the world that I wanted to go. And so I, you know, as a 16 year old, you, I was thinking I'm going to be like an adult and pick somewhere that I won't be able to afford later when I'm like 20, you know, uh -huh. like someplace that I can invest in. And so uh, I picked Egypt. And so, oh, wow. yeah. And so my mom, who obviously is a woman, went to the Middle East with me where, you know, she, she respected the culture, covered up and everything. We went for a month and a half and we backpacked around Cairo, all the way down the Nile. We took a Felucca, which is a sailboat, traditional sailboat down there. Yeah. Went all the way down. You know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the area, but as a 16-year-old, it the culture shock 
of being okay, this that's little, extreme culture shock yeah you know and no one looking my mom in the eye no one talking to her and always asking me about our situation like we were at a hotel once and they wouldn't even talk to her and said what which um what kind of accommodation would you like and because they don't they don't recognize at that time especially right and this is before the arab spring and so they're of course they don't the the culture is just so different than the canadian tim horns culture you know yeah. that's how I, yeah. I coin it and so seeing people not respect someone that has been your authority figure for your whole life is just whoa and everyone has guns and you're around temples and it was a, a trip of a lifetime but um one of the aspects of that trip that i really wanted to to include was the red sea i want to dive in the red sea and so okay. we went to dahab which is part of Egypt, right out of Sharm el Sheikh, and we dove. As a 16 year old, I was diving in the Red Sea. And wow. it's just, well, you come back home to your grade 10 class, and how do you explain that to your friends? Yeah. Right? It's, it's really tough because all of them are going to Palm Springs, you know, Chicago yeah. to see family or, you know, Ontario. Yeah. And here you are being like, yeah, well, we got escorted by a cop you know, to make yeah. sure we went to the temple and then get shot, you know? Wow. And so, um, yeah, it's, you know, marine biology has taken me and inspired me to travel all over the world. My 18th birthday, we went to the Maldives, you know, cause we really yeah. want to dive the, the Indian ocean. And mm. so all over the place we've, we've dove and my mom has been such a inspiration for all that. And has, oh, we've never had like the newest car or a boat in the yeah. garage. It's always been traveling always all of our money towards traveling. And wow. so that's, like I said, those are lessons that I'll instill on in my children. Uh, whenever a girl texts me back, that'd be great. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where we're at with all that. But yeah, marine biology has, has been the inspiration for all my travels. Always. Wow. So what do you find? Uh, Cause you've been to these different, you've been in water all over the world. What do you notice similar and different about the ecosystems where you go? It's um, something that I've, I've just recently been realizing as an adult from, from 20 years old and up. Like I said, I'm ancient. I'm 27 now. Okay. My knees mm -hmm. are hurting. It's cold outside and my, I get aches in my back. And uh, I've noticed that life is so, such a pattern everywhere you go. You know, it's so simplistic, just as I'm sure a civil engineer would look at a bridge and say, I can clearly see the schematics in my brain on how this would work, where its low points are, what the angles are, the physics of it. I can look at an ecosystem and be like, hey, that's the lower end of the tropics, you know, and really break down what an ecosystem is in that area, just because, you know, I've studied it my whole life now. And so when I go to different places, I just look for those patterns again. Well, what's mm. on the lowest tropic, you know, level? Oh, it's this plankton. Oh, this is the predator around here. Just as if you were to go hiking, you would yeah. know the biggest thing that could eat me out here is a black bear. Like you do it unconsciously. Everyone does. Yeah. W when they enter a new situation, you know, you look at a desert. You don't think there's anything there, but there's vegetation everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the mammals? It's so interesting to me seeing how animals and plants adapt to our climate wherever you go. Yeah. And how we're throwing curveballs <clears throat> about climate change out there and they're still adapting right now. Interesting enough, small tangent, but you know, garbage Island, obviously off the Pacific, you know, the floating garbage, Texas size Island. Yeah. They're, I'm aware of it. Yeah. I've never been, but I hear it's beautiful in the summers. Um, <laughs> a paper just came out about how animals are adapting to the plastics out there. Really? About how removing some of the island might be detrimental to these species now. Really? Isn't that crazy that they have adapted so to such a degree that some of their survival is dependent now on this anthropogenic um, situation we put them in? So how do how do how do humans deal with that? Ex you know what? Another mystery. 12 a.m. now we're at rich see these are the things that just go through my mind as i'm laying there by myself alone in my twin size bed text me back please <laughs> so it's uh it's really an interesting thought because and it's not that far off of what you and i experience every day with squirrels and raccoons you know i'm not sure about chicago because i'm sure it's cold 
um, where I am, it's the, tr the tropics of Canada is what they coin it as. So we have no <laughs> snow, you know, it was like 10 degrees today kind of thing. But what I'm getting at is raccoons and squirrels and deer to a degree are dependent now on urban environments to survive. Yeah. Why is it any different for fish? Yeah. And so these are the questions that scientists are asking themselves now. How do we deal with it? We've made such a you know, mess of the ocean with these plastics. And those are the plastics we can see, yeah. right? There's invisible ones, as I'm sure you know, you know, microplastics are huge right now mm. with shipping and all that kind of stuff. And those are accumulated in the flesh of these animals yeah, and going right back down into our stomachs. And so how are they adapting? How are they just not dying? These are all the questions we have to ask ourselves and uh, adapt to. How can you relate uh, concepts you learn in nature and marine biology to your own life? Ooh, that's a that's a really interesting question. That's that's a good one. Marine biology is is super simplistic in the fact that you know fish are pretty. They're very colorful. People like colorful. Like just as people look at birds, very colorful oh there's an eagle kind of thing right and for marine biology to relate that to my to my life is just you gotta slow down to see the pretty things you know if you keep looking so big and oh you know what's the next job what's what's really you know glamorized on social media even you yeah. gotta look micro you gotta look really small down and you'll see some amazing things you really will if you just stop and look uh when i was a child i should say when i was six or seven I would take out my snorkel gear and came in and go down to the beach area there. And I would spend hours on one head of coral, looking at all these baby fish that are just looking out, looking out and then going back in because they see this giant human, you know, I was an eight year old. I was probably like five feet giant. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's just so interesting seeing the, the animal behavior just by stopping for a second. Don't go to the wreck. Don't go to the wall, go to the small coral head. And just take your time and really look at what it is. Same as a tree. You look mm -hmm. at a tree. It's not just a tree. There's insects all around it. Oh, there's a bird's nest even. Oh, yeah. I wonder what kind of bird that is. It's just slowing down is what I take from marine biology uh, into my life. Slowing down. So you've been, you've been to a lot of beaches. I have, yeah. So yeah, you've been to a lot of beaches. What's your favorite beach? Oh, favorite beach. You know, I have such a soft spot in my, in my brain as well as my heart, but yeah, my brain mostly uh, soft part of my heart um, for North Pacific beaches. Something about the rocks and the, the storms that just crash into them. You know, it, it's romantic. It's, you know, it's very, very cool. I think, and nothing beats being in a windbreaker with rain pelting you in the face as you see waves crash upon the shore, right? You know, yeah, you could go down to Seven Mile Beach in the Cayman Islands, rated the hottest beach on the world because of the girls there and the guys. Um, <laughs> but there's just no, there's no thrill there. It's just sand, right? Yeah. It's just sand and, you know, marine biologists know sand makes for bad scuba diving because there's nothing for life to grab onto. So it's not as interesting, right? Not, yeah, it's well, and here's the thing, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know, what's the word for it? hypocritical because there's life everywhere, you know, even yeah. in the sand desert of the ocean, but you want the rocks. Yeah. You know, you want the rocks, but I think being on the West coast, just seeing the force of a small fraction of nature mm -hmm. hitting you is just, there's something really human about that too. I think it's really cool. You how would you describe the difference between the Pacific ocean and the Atlantic ocean? Like what big differences are there besides that there are different places? <laughs> yeah. Bodies of water. Um, the main difference for me, you know, I have family off in uh, Nova Scotia. So I've actually been out to the Atlantic quite a bit. Um, okay. I, I think the main difference for me at, at least is that, the they have this saying that the pacific ocean has really dumb boring fish and really vibrant coral and the atlantic has really bright fish and dumb looking boring coral and so huh. the diving is completely different from each side of things there um the atlantic i feel is more not as wild 
I know that's probably wrong to say, but it's just like, I just think of lobster and cod when I think Atlantic okay. and just like villages like Nova Scotia. I literally picture Nova Scotia. Okay. Of course, the Pacific, I see rainforests and bears interacting with the salmon that come up. Whereas mm-hmm. the Atlantic, I think of, what is it, blueberries that they harvest? I don't even know. It's just, it's just the left side of, of the it, ocean for me. It seems like, uh, yeah, you say, did you say wild? Yeah. It seems like the Northwest, and, and I kind of feel this way too. Like I live in the Midwest and it feels like mm. if I go West, like in the Rockies and being out there, everything is just like bigger, grander, more majestic. Yeah. Whereas like East, it's just like, it is what it is and it, it is its thing. But like the West is like, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely wilder. I, I think uh, I was right in saying the West is definitely wilder in that side. I feel like the East Coast, even of the States, is just more anthropogenic. It's more human. If That's that makes true, sense. Yeah. There's, there's more farming yeah. going on. Um, because of that, because of the farming that goes on on the East Coast rather than the West Coast, there's a lot of fertilizers and um, chemicals get dumped into the ocean all the time around there. Now, I'm no expert in that kind of stuff at all so i couldn't tell you if it actually affects populations of fish but it's just another thought i have yeah you know? you're thinking about yeah another 1 a.m conversation right there so then what what is your favorite animal my favorite animal yeah so it's kind of a you know a mini tangent here it's I, I do you have a spirit animal rich let me ask you that do you have a spirit, spirit animal? animal yeah uh, I don't, I don't think I do. You don't think so? See, here's the thing. I went to a, I went to a shaman uh, while okay. I was in Egypt. Okay. Now, when trust you're me, 16, these, you're 16 these you went to a shaman? Yeah. Well, you got it, man. You got to go to a Bedouin, uh, you know, township and they, you know, speak broken English. But what really attracted me to this one shaman was this deck of cards they had. Okay. And this, in this deck of cards, I saw animals on them. And I was like, yo. You know, I, I know a little bit of Arabic because I, you know, read on the plane trying to get a hold of numbers to, like, yeah. you know, get a hold of what's what I'm entering in as a 16 year old. And so this this person spoke a little bit of English, too. And I know you asked me what my favorite animal is, but what basically the question is, is what do you see yourself as? What do other people see yourself as and what you truly are? Those are three different animals. OK, what you so, see yourself as. Yeah. What other people see you as and what you truly are what you truly are and so it's really interesting so they have the cards out on the table and you, you pick your your what you see yourself as like face down you don't know what it is and what other people see you as face down and then what you truly are and it's supposed to reveal aspects of you that you don't know so i flip over the first one what i think i am and i get a shark and i'm blown out of the water i'm like hell yeah <laughs> get wrecked. i'm a fucking shark that's dope like yeah. that's yeah you know, take that mom I'm a yeah. shark, you <laughs> I'm know? <a> shark. <laughs> and so I flip that over. Uh, the next one I flip over is a grizzly bear. So that's what people see you as. Now, at this time, I'm 16. I don't have a beard. You now don't have I'm the beard, a, yeah. You no, know, I'm, I'm more of a grizzly now. And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm on a streak. Like, yeah. yeah, I got a shark, bear. And then but my, what are my you final, truly? What am I truly is the real question, Rich. So I flip it over. And I've never been as disappointed. Well, until she didn't text me back, but... I, I flipped I flipped it over and it was a red panda. A red panda? A red, that's, not, that's not too bad though. Dude, I got a shark, a bear, and then a red panda. Ladies this love red thing pandas. that comes up on its on its like feet, right? Yeah. So a little red panda, I know you probably know, but for everyone that doesn't know what a red panda is, it looks like a raccoon that's been fried as a marshmallow <laughs> and is dumber. <laughs> it's not even a trash panda. It's just this this animal that falls out of trees. Anyways, um, then the shaman gives you this book and it's translated in English, Japanese, all these things. And it goes to the page that you're a red panda and you're like, sorry for your luck, man. You're a red panda. Read this yeah. paragraph. And it was so spot on that it was crazy. I was really? reading it being like, no, fuck no. And like, no way, no way. And then I was like, what? It's like even it says your strengths, says your weaknesses, says your tendencies, how you with you know, the ladies in the club, it says, you know, how you treat your mom, like all these different. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, to a T man, to a T. And so anyways, when people ask me what my favorite animal is, I say uh, dog. dog. Because, 
<laughs> red pandas are so bland. No, but uh, I think a sea lion is my, is my favorite animal because it's a, you know, it's a doggo and a marine, you know, yeah. put them together, you get a, you get a sea lion. Uh, I spent a lot of time with, time with sea lions in the Sea of Cortez as well. And so okay. sharing that um, experience with those animals and seeing how playful they are, except even as they are wild animals and how they are literally golden retrievers of the ocean. They have no ill in their brain. Just sea lions? Sea lions. Yeah. The puppies of the ocean. So do you feel, do you feel sea lions and animals in general? Um, sea lions are mammals, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Marine mammals. Yeah. So do you think each one has different personalities? A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And I don't know if that's, just because I'm so interested in animal behavior and how they interact, you can predict what an animal is going to do to a degree. But yeah. just as you and I would interact with a deserted island, you can only predict so far. Yeah, we're probably going to look for shelter. Yeah, we're going to probably look for water. But what day are you going to break? How, how yeah. far can you go before you get pushed too far? And with animals, it's, it's a lot of the same thing. You know, obviously not to that scale, but this other animal is interacting with me. How far until I bite them? How far can I go? And that personality okay. changes between whatever it is, you know, Yeah. whether that be a sea lion or, you know, a damselfish that is two inches big, you know, these, these animals all have their own reality, whether that be simplistic or not, it's still a reality that they're living. Huh. What about yeah. sea turtles? Do they have personalities? Oh Yeah. Do you want to talk about personalities, about sea turtles? Listen, like I said, it's a family show. I'll refrain from swearing, okay? I know my mom's probably going to watch this to be your viewer, but sea turtles especially have personalities. They are such assholes. <laughs> <laughs> they are all just big old assholes. Um, when I was working down in the Cayman Islands, I was a, a sea turtle researcher. And one of our jobs yeah. is when a female comes up to lay, they go into this kind of coma state when they lay eggs and that's when researchers come in they take a genetic sample from one of their flippers and they tag them with a metal tag that okay. you know has their barcode and we can tell when they come back kind of thing right and if they come back and they have a metal tag we can scan it oh this is trudy from 06 like okay. good seeing you lady so anyways they they're all assholes every single one i've not met a nice sea turtle and what happens is you have to you know, I'm five, nine, man. I'm like 200 pounds. Yeah. I'm small in height, but I'm pretty jack. You know, I feel like I can hold yeah. a sea turtle. And one of my, um, my superiors says, Hey, Bryce, get on the back of the sea turtle and hold it there while we clip it just in case it wakes up. I'm like, yeah, no problem. This thing is a small animal. I got this. Yeah. I get on this sea turtle, Rich. I get on it. And like I said, I'm backing up. I'm sorry if you see my loafers. I'm sorry. I'm backing up though. I grab this, the carapace of the sea turtle. I grab the shell of it. And this thing just wakes up and takes a huge chunk out of my thigh. Just <laughs> immediately. Doesn't look what it is. Takes a chunk. And I'm swearing, like I said, your kid show. And I'm swearing, I'm swearing. And then it takes the new metal tag on its flipper and slices me down the leg with it. Just, and it what? knows. It knows, man. It knows that it's, something's on it and it just wants to mess it up. You know, like I said, we're, I'm being, I'm, being, I'm holding it, you know, just as I would a woman and it just cuts down my leg. And I'm like, you bitch, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> I'm trying to save you <laughs> endangered animal. So anyways, those turtles are, I think what happens is that those animals know that it's a really sensitive time when they come up to shore, they need yeah. to lay eggs, get out of there. Yeah. They got thing, business right? to take care of. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as something impedes it, whether it be a bush, whether it be, you know, a five, nine, 200 pound handsome looking guy, I, you know, it, it doesn't matter. To them. It really doesn't. They'll take you out. And so, uh, yeah, of course they have personalities, uh, more of an agenda, but, um, <laughs> you know, a controversial opinion and I'm really excited to, to hear your, your opinion on it as well. Okay. The worst animal in the world, I will I'll declare it now clip this future Bryce is a dolphin dolphins what? are no I know I know man dolphins are the biggest assholes in the animal kingdom the only second to maybe an orca because they're big ass dolphins still okay. a dolphin 
but they are just too smart, man. They're too smart. You know, they, they just know the game. They know, they know the how game. to play it. They know how to play it too. And they're cute. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're cute sounding. They look cute. You know, everyone's watched flipper saves them yeah. from a hammerhead. Absolute assholes, dude. Absolute assholes. Meanwhile, the sharks are getting the bad rap for everything. I know that. Yo, <laughs> you should see a PowerPoint I made in grade 11. <laughs> <laughs> How sharks are the, the victim of all this stuff. Okay. So tell me about dolphins. Um, I hear that like dolphins and elephants are like the second smartest animals in the world. Yeah. Next to pigs, apparently. Pigs are apparently really high up there as well. With, really? Yeah. Brain power. But yeah, dolphins are, I don't know if you've ever seen footage of orcas when they hunt up north. And there's a seal on a little iceberg or ice platform, they call it. And one orca goes in front of it with its mouth open. And then four others just make a small tidal wave to push it off and goes into the orca's mouth. Um, that's crazy. That's insane. Let's talk about that for a second. These animals are making coordinated attacks so one of them eats. <laughs> like, they're not sharing it. That's that. That one seals for that one orca. And they are like, oh, well, it's Jeff's time to eat. Okay. What other animal? Have you ever seen a dog like nudge kibble to another dog? No, they eat it. Yeah. They eat it right then and there. And so these animals are hyper intelligent, like super duper smarter than me, kind of intelligent, knowing, you know, the knowing that if they go up too close to this iceberg, they're going to scare it. And so they back off just enough to be outside of their little visual reach. Like these are insanely intelligent animals, orcas, dolphins, and because they're so smart, they're assholes. I'm sure you grew up with a kid that was too smart for his own good and asking the teacher all these questions. And you're like, dude, I'm just trying to make it to lunch. <laughs> I'm literally just trying to make it to lunch. You're lucky I showed up today. I just got the keys. It was my 16th birthday. Bryce is in Egypt right now and I need to get to lunch right now. And so I feel like I was that. <laughs> Student. Oh, were you okay? Well, about you. <laughs> no one else is asking questions in class. I, I should, I just keep asking yeah. questions then. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what are we going to use quadratic formula? You're that guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine, man. There's nothing wrong with those people. I'm just saying that uh, they're assholes. <laughs> yeah. So orcas and dolphins, they're, they're too smart. They'll terrorize puffer fish. Dolphins will, sorry. Um, because the, the toxins they get from terrorizing this puffer fish make them high. And I know really? you're thinking, Bryce, yo, you, you know, I was with you with the orcas, with the sea lions, but this is too much. Rich, after we're done this podcast, after you're like, wow, that was a lot. I'm going to have to bleep them all the time. I want <laughs> you to look up dolphins and puffer fish and you tell me if they're not assholes. Dolphins and puffer fish. Yeah. Make sure you write that down. That's, that's your 11 o'clock tonight. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so. I know. Where do we go from how here? Much, <laughs> how much do we not know about dolphins? About dolphins specifically? Like, yeah. Or, or orcas. Like, yeah. Obviously, because we're different species, like we can't get inside the heads or like communicate with them. How much do we not know what's going inside their brains? Like, are they actually communicating, having fun? Just, just like, do they have like best friends? Do they have, you know, right. these like uh, cliques and, and politics with it like i don't like what goes yeah. through the mind of a dolphin i don't know no, these are yeah you know what now we're talking these are the yeah. NPM <laughs> conversations that i have no we actually know that they have very much a hierarchy in their systems okay because they're so intelligent they understand that some of their you know whether that be your grandma your mom or your dad those are better pros to hunting than you who's a newborn right yeah. they understand that actually we have orcas that come across our island all the time and uh, call resident orcas. And the grandmother teaches the kids how to hunt. Super random, super cool though, because we can, 
we understand how to identify these orcas by their dorsal fin. So a little fin up here. You look at my diagram here. Yeah, we got, we got <laughs> this very intricate diagram. Yeah, obviously, like I said, don't look back here. But the dorsal fin is the top fin. Now, those are fish. We're talking about marine mammals, but the same thing. And so we take a photo from the boat. We can, we can tell by the saddle or the spot on the back of an orca who they are, right? Oh, that's, you know, Jeff, the orca. You know, we know he's been around for 30 years because he has this tall, the dorsal fin, or it's curved this way. So we know it's a female or it's super erect. It's a male kind of thing. And so we can understand the hierarchy. And then when we go out there and we see them feeding, oh, why is Jeff just chilling back at Rock Cove and his mom is out there hunting? Like it's, we understand these things. What we don't understand is how they interact with others, other people outside their pod. You know, okay. do they do they interact with a, another resident orca pod, you know, productively or is it territory? You know, it's yeah. um, we don't know that yet because it's very, you know, are we hunting at the same time? Are we just chilling? Yeah. You know, are we going after the same girl? Like it's it's so situational, which is another thing with animals is animal behavior is so interesting. If you really think about it, do you have any pets at home? I, we have a small dog in the apartment. It's my roommates. A small dog. Okay. Yorkie so, Pashan. You know, oh, love it. Love it. Very small dog. Yeah. You know, what would be your ideal dog? Uh, I saw this one. What does it look like? A little bigger. Um, it always looks like he has a smile on his face. Uh, okay. <laughs> Is there a specific one you're thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> That maybe your I, don't, I don't know i i was never like a dog person until uh okay. now now living i moved in like a year ago with my roommate and he had right. this little dog so now it's like this interesting dynamic it's like the, another personality in the space that Absolutely. you have to like interact with it's really interesting well later tonight i'm gonna kind of blow your mind well maybe not maybe you already know this but all animals are either right-handed or left-handed really? all animals so next time you're with this dog, I don't know what his name is. Put him. What's his name? Angeal. Yeah. Awful name. Angeal. Anyway, <laughs> look at what Angeal holds a stick with or braces itself when it eats or jumps up on the couch with first, because that will be its podness. That's an actual term, podness. And if you look at other animals, you'll start noticing that other animals tend to lean to a side. And you're like, well, Bryce, what about a bird? A podness is a bird. Well, let me tell you, Rich. If you play a predator sound behind a bird, okay. it will turn to its dominant side. So it can better judge the, the predator as it comes at it. So for instance, the seagull, and you play an eagle sound behind it, yeah. it's going to face your dominant way. Just as if you were about really? to run from a bear, if you're left-handed, you're going this way. If you're right-handed, you're going this way. Because you have a better chance of surviving that encounter going to your dominant side. And so scientists are finding out that fish have a preference on what side they like to swim on. And same with orcas, dolphins, you name it. Orangutans apparently are almost all left-handed dominantly. Really? But, yeah. But dogs follow a very similar trend to humans, which is really eerie when you think about it. It would that, make sense, though, because they've probably been around humans so long, they've probably picked up tendencies, right? This is a great question. Huh. Well, how far, like, so, yeah, go ahead, continue. Yeah, so whether do we know what dolphins and orcas are capable of, what questions are we asking? Yeah. Is, there, is, is the real overarching question is, what are we curious about that's going to either benefit their species or benefit us, right? How does an orca know that if it bites on the left side of a great white, that it's going to get delivered? And that's the most yeah. calorically dense part of a shark. Right? Like, how, how do they know that? Is it because they've been around for thousands, millions of years? Right. But, and that's, you know, that could be very much it. But how can you just use that as an answer? Like, what makes it that way? Like, is it just because eventually they're like, you know, if you bite this shark on this side, it's going to be way better than if you bite it on this side? Like, is that just inherent in their brain? Or do they recognize that this is a great white? Oh, this is a dolphin. Like, do they, can they comprehend that these two animals are different just by looking at them? Just as a dog looks at a human yeah. 
from a window, does it know that that human is its owner or is that just a random human? Like there's consciousness going in and out of its brain of understanding that, hey, rich has glasses and this guy has a beard. This guy yeah. is not rich, right? Yeah. And so for orcas and dolphins, how much can they really understand underwater of all places, right? Are they using echolocation to bounce off sound waves and be like, that's not the shape of a tuna. Yeah. That's the shape of a boat, right? Super interesting question though. We don't know the answers to it, right? We, we can make guesses, but you know, back in the 1400s, we thought blood was fire, right? Yeah. Like how long do we go with something being like, wait a second, it's totally wrong. Like it's actually this all along. So what does your, it- your daily process look like? Like, are you sitting on, are you, are you, <laughs> yeah. in a, are you swimming in the water and you yeah. just sit on a, a coral and you just like, with with uh <laughs> write down observations wa- waterproof yeah. paper writing down all your observations yeah. you know that's that's mentally what i where i am all the time is <laughs> <laughs> just looking out and be like what's going on here uh, a lot of times you know i don't really those mysteries always they're recreationally or they're they're hobbies of mine to think about and to pursue but my real love and passion is to save the ocean mm-hmm is, is to, to absolutely do all I can to be an advocate, to be a conservationist for the ocean. And so if I can tell a story, for instance, I use this uh, metaphor all the time, not even a metaphor, this story being, have you ever seen a rhino? You personally? Yeah. At the zoo. Okay, perfect. Have you, right. Okay. At a zoo. That's perfect. Have you ever seen a blue whale? No, that's something I, I I'd be terrified to see. Oh, I saw at the okay. uh, American Museum of Natural History. I don't know if it's oh, yeah, taxidermy it or if it's not. Is that that's is that tax? Right. Is, was that a real one or no? I think it wouldn't be. No, but it, it could be. I haven't been there, but I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Right, you've seen the the skeleton or preser- preservation of one. Right. Now, with the rhino example, how did you feel when you saw that rhino? It's big. Big, right? Did you feel kind of bad for it that there's only a few of them kind of thing? Like, what were your feelings towards seeing an animal like that, that you know is endangered? I used to watch this show called Kratz Creatures all the time. And seeing the rhinos and then like the stories of the poachers and things like that, I always felt bad. And then, yeah, like in the zoo, you're like, it's such a huge animal and there's like so few left now, it seems like, yeah. right? Um, totally. Yeah, that's why. Right. It's, it's surreal, right? It almost yeah. doesn't seem like a real animal because it's so big or even, you know, you can make a small example, like a sort of orangutan. But what I'm getting at is that I've never seen a rhino in the wild. I've never seen, a, I've never interacted with a rhino. I've never had a moment with a rhino. But I have had a moment with a blue whale and I've had had a moment with a whale shark and I've had moments with sea lions. And so I gravitate to care to things that I've experienced. Would I be sad if rhinos went extinct? A billion percent, yes. I'd be devastated for weeks if they all went extinct. Would I be devastated about blue whales going extinct? I would be like, I would be bedridden because I've had this interaction and no one else will be able to have the same feeling I got with the sound. And that tears my heart apart that they, they can never care again about this animal. And yeah. for me, giving those people that experience to interact with a blue whale or a rhino or these animals that are so endangered and so exotic, but also beautiful, that's what I, that's what really gets me going is, is giving those experiences to people is, is that's what my day to day, what I would like it to be. And that's what I really strive to be every day is to, to tell these stories about how this sea lion, I threw a stick in the water and the sea lion went and got it. It's like, what is going on? Like, that's such a, a magical moment with an animal. And if all sea lions are eradicated, no, no kid, no nine-year-old kid is going to have that moment. Yeah. And that's devastating to me. And so that's why, you know, I, I need to save the ocean. And that's my, that's my goal is to be such a, the, the leader of ocean conservation. 
Yeah. And so uh, I'm just really happy to be here to even talk about it at all. So what was it like next to a blue whale? It's unreal. It's like literally your my brain, my primitive dumbass brain can't comprehend this animal that's close to 100 feet long coming out of the water to take a breath, to fill its 100 feet long body up with air, all of its lungs, and then go back down. And my, to my surprise, we saw that it had a calf with it. It had a baby that it was pushing up every 10 minutes to take a breath as well with it. And then they go back down for 10 minutes. You could time it almost on a timer because it knows that the baby can't hold its breath. And okay. so it pushed it up every 10 minutes. How does this whale know this, man? How does it know that the baby blue whale doesn't have enough strength to bring itself up to take a breath? And so every 10 minutes, it reaches its limit and it will be pushed up. This animal is 100 feet long, man. 100 feet. Like, think about any school bus you've ever seen. We're talking two of them. Like, yeah, it's, it's just, it's unreal. It's actually crazy to think about that this animal has blood in it, that it is not a machine. Yeah. And you're out in the open. Well, in that case, I was in the Sea of Cortez and it just came out oh. out of nowhere. And we all freaked out trying to get our drone going, try to get GoPros in the water. Because like I said, having that moment is number one in my brain. Sharing that moment is number two. Because yeah. if I can make Rich from Chicago take a plane down to see if Cortez to see this blue whale and be like, you know what? I'm not going to choose this tuna product now because I, I mess with that blue whale down there. And I know if I choose this other tuna product, it's not going to do anything good for it. Yeah. Like those small micro changes, they add up. They add up. What's the most endangered species in the ocean? The vaquita which is a small porpoise in the north coast of the Sea of Cortez, right in the pocket of the Sea of Cortez. Really? There's about 13 of them, I believe. Just the, thir 13? Yeah, just there. Yeah, plus, yeah, three more. Yeah, the Vaquita. So it's V-A-Q-U-I-T-A, -I, I believe. Hold on. Yeah, please bring it up. V A Q. U I T A. I'm sure it'll come up. Look how cute that little animal is. Yeah, that is that's a cute little little guy. Huh. People have died over that animal in in northern the Sea of Cortez because the government of Mexico is saying, hey, don't fish here anymore. And locals are saying, hey, we have to fish. We're a remote village up in the north. And, uh, you know, people open fire, people shoot for what they, they care about. And so yeah. there's been deaths over this animal because of a uh, lack of fishing regulation, lack of carrying. So then it, how, what role do you have in trying to make sure it doesn't go extinct? Well, what my role is, uh, is basically giving those communities um, alternatives to, you know, you can just go to, a, let's say, a remote island in the Philippines and mm -hmm. say, hey, guys, you've been fishing sharks your whole lives. You guys got to stop it. I can show you all these graphs. I can show you these stats why it matters. Don't fish sharks anymore. We need them. And they can understand that. And they can say, yep, we won't fish sharks. Well, let's say 15% of them die in the next two years because they're not fishing sharks anymore, right? We put a ban yeah. on it. Can't have sharks anymore. 15% of the population dies. As soon as that becomes personal, as soon as your grandfather, your grandma, your mom dies, because we can't go eat this one fish out there, you're going to go out there and eat the fish. Yeah. You have to give alternatives to these communities. You know, whether that be, here's a species of potato that grows in a tropical climate. This will, you know, feed your iron requirements. And so you don't need these sharks anymore. Right. You need to give alternatives. You can't just go into a grocery store that sells sharks and say, you guys are bad. Stop this. Yeah. Right. The guy is selling the shark doesn't know any different. He got this from the fisherman. Like he's just right. a clerk. You yeah. can't just throw blood on fur and say, you're the problem. Right. I go to the actual reason why it is a problem. Huh. So my, my job, my role 
in a lot of those cases is to give alternatives, to give ways that they can get their nutri nutrients that they've been getting from these animals other ways, right? That's a very small part of my job role because I don't really deal with people in that way, you know, very aggressive state. And so I'm more of like a, you know, kumbaya, everyone let's get along, yeah. let's tell some jokes, you know, mango margs on me kind of thing. Nice. You know, so that's, that's my role. <laughs> loosely translated yeah so i'm uh we talked a little bit about it earlier with like tracking and putting tags on yeah. what are what are tags like like do you have to once you put a tag on do we now have like geo locators and like other technology on it that we can track it or to like get information on that sea turtle again do we have to physically catch it and then see oh yeah this is linda yeah. right here or you know is the technology we can just like it, it's tough because a lot of these places that do ocean conservation aren't well funded um mm -hmm. you know we're talking about random coast of costa rica looking at leatherback turtles right um uh so it depends on your funding of the research community or that institution so you see the big ones out of new york um they have the big geo taggers on the great whites That'll tell you everything. I'll tell you what it had for lunch that day wow. kind of thing. But you go down to the Cayman Islands where the budget is a shoestring and you're working pretty much for free just for the experience of getting bit by an asshole <laughs> is the, just big blunt metal tags in a flipper and it has a yeah. number on it. And you write the number down saying the characteristics of the turtle. Maybe it has a shark bite out of it. Yeah. You know, that's karma turtle. Don't bite me and maybe a shark won't. But you write it down. And then you can reference it, you know, two years when it comes back up. And so that's the really primitive version of it. Um, but technologies that are coming out, it's like fish ID is huge right now. Taking a, so what you have is a GoPro mounted on this large bar. And on the bar is two laser pointers that are one foot apart. And so okay. the GoPro is in the middle recording and the laser is going right out. This big beam laser and that shows a foot. And so you can measure fish as you swim and scuba dive by taking video of it and seeing where the lasers range on it. And then later you can, in post-production, look at it on the computer and be like, well, this is this far away from this laser. That's about a foot. And you can go through hundreds of them in one dive. And that's how fish surveying works with photo ID. And so once you get that laser in the video, you can put it in this database and it'll look at certain scale colorations and it'll be like a fingerprint. And so you can put that video back in and it'll be like, that's Carl from 08. How do you not recognize Carl, right? Like, and so technology is getting crazy good with uh, photo ID and uh, measurements and uh, geotagging and that kind of stuff. But for most marine conservation efforts, it's pretty primal. It's pretty, okay. you know, take a photo of it, put it in the database, maybe we'll see it again kind of thing. Um, yeah. But that's where the funding needs to be. Like, um, there's, I, I don't want to say the wrong number, but there's under 5,000 blue whales, let's say, right? Why yeah. are we not tagging these suckers? Why are we not making sure that we keep tabs on them, right? I'm sure some instant, our institutions are, but why, why are we not putting all of our money towards these big species that make our planet what it is? You know, there's so much... Um, there's so much talk about, uh, this is a great example, pandas, dumb old pandas, not red pandas. Those are special in my heart. Don't diss them, all right? I, only I can diss them. But pandas, like big old pandas. I remember I was in third year biology class, a fish studies class, ichthyology. And my prof put this big tuna up. You know how people hold tunas? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. And they stand there like, yeah. go, or, you know, they pull the shot. Anyways, they hold it. And um, he's like, how do we feel about this? And the girl like, oh, it sucks. Like, tuna are great, but they're delicious, whatever, right? Then he put up a photo of a panda being strung up by a hook with all these uh, poachers yeah. around it. And there was bloody outcry. Like, why would you show us that photo? That's awful. Look at all that blood. Like, how dare you? Like, you know, prof heard it all and took it. And he's like, that tuna is three times as endangered as that panda you just saw. Mm. but you have outcry for the panda but the tuna is going to be extinct before the panda is and when animals get to a certain point we know they're going to go extinct there's no coming back like the vaquita it's done unless there's a pod somewhere we don't know about it's it's over for them 
It just physically, wow. you can't make them mate enough in their yeah. lifetimes to repopulate. It just won't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so with that tuna and panda example, we like to care about things that have fur, that are mammals, that we can put personalities on. Yeah. Now, the panda is so cute and cuddly and, you know, it's hung up by a hook. Right? Where there's outcry about it. Whereas the tuna, which indirectly is more endangered, there's little outcry at all for it. Yeah. And so it's, it's interesting what humans value in that certain way, right? Yeah. Um, about what we perceive as, as cruelty. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, a little tangent there, but that's, uh, it, these are, these are the interesting points of the field. Yeah. And that's great perspective. How, how often do organizations work together to like, try to solve these problems? Um, it depends once again, who has the sexier budget? You know, who just got granted $45,000 to go tag great whites in South Africa compared to $12,000 looking at sea slugs, like nudibranchs, Yeah. right? Well, great whites are the, the sexy animal. Everyone wants to work with big pelagic animals, you know, yours truly does. Um, whereas sea slugs are like, eh, not really that cool, right? However, sea slugs are instrumental in the whole ecosystem as all animals are but the funding goes towards those keystone species that are very, you know, blue planet, you know, Sir David Attenborough's talking all about kind of thing. So it's, it's interesting. Which is, how, which is wrong. Yeah. So it's interesting how like as humans are, our just view of what we think, what we think about things, whether it be from like influenced by a culture or just like what we're physically more attracted to or whatever kind of drives funding or decisions on, on where we decide to, to put priority. Yeah. It's a good way to look at that. It's, you know, it's one of the biggest issues that science deals with. And you know, what's even harder is that the animals we don't know about. You know, deep sea animals are a really um, developing subject and field right now in science. These, you know, deep sea vents and like blood worms and crabs that live at 10 kilometers down. Like that's really interesting. And when we do dredges or we do excavation, we bring it up and we see that there's pollution in them from us, you know, mm -hmm. 10 kilometers down and they have plastic particles in them it really makes you think that no one's safe. None of these animals are, are safe from us. They're all getting affected. And where our funding needs to be is the conservation with it and not the activism of it, is how can we make the most species survive? And that's where the funding needs to be cut down the middle and given to a blanket statement, right? And this is might be a little polarizing, but when Trump came into power and took themselves out of the climate change, budget a lot of these small institutions suffered and a lot of the research had to be stopped because they, there was no money in these in these small areas and because of that it was really tough to reignite it later on when there was money put towards it and so yeah. during covid during the pandemic it was really tough because a lot of this money went to ethnogenics like human you know we got to get this vaccine going which once again 100 percent with but because of that, these blue whales, these rhinos, these animals were put to the side and said, we'll deal with you guys later. We got to worry about our own species right now. Yeah. And so that funding got sucked dry from all these different institutions and put towards that, which once again, fully on board with, you know, mm -hmm. I have a 90 year old grandmother and I wanted her to be vaccinated as soon as possible. My friends, my family, yeah. all that stuff. I'm just saying that the money is never divvied up evenly. It's always yeah. ever changing and flowing, a lot like the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, poetic. There you very go. Po very poetic. There, there, there's your tagline right there. <laughs> so we we've had uh, we've had quite a great discussion on marine biology. To uh, kind of close out our conversation, I would like to ask you some more personal questions. And okay. uh, so, what do we got? What are three musical artists? in your heavy rotation right now? Well, Rich, uh, uh, I'm 5'9". Oh, not my height. Um, my artists that are in rotation, 
you know, I'm such a sucker for Drake, dude. I'm Drake. such a sucker for Drake. Yeah. You know, it's, he's from the six, you know, he's Canadian, such a okay, sucker. Yeah. Um, but to, to kind of throw a wrench in all this, uh, when I think of artists, I, I also think of what, what influences me as well. And, you know, not just art as in music, but, you know, actors and all that. I know that's yeah. kind of going away from your question, but Someone who's been in my mind a lot recently is Kevin Hart, of all people. Kevin Hart. Why, yeah. why is that? You know, his goal to be the first comedian billionaire um, is, what, is what drives him to be, you know, everywhere. Start these new, I don't know if you've seen this new drama series, True Story, out on Netflix. This isn't a plug. I'm not affiliated, but I am affiliated and it is a plug um, to, to go watch uh, that short story. And it just shows the range he's willing to go to, to push that narrative of his goal. And that drive that he describes in interviews and after all that through his shows and his work ethic is very relatable to me with the ocean. Ironically is that I will stop at nothing to achieve my goal of saving the ocean and helping out all these animals that I really care about. And it's just something I really relate to. Um, you know, if it's Drake talking about women and getting money and all that stuff, you know, I just transfer that over to, uh, to what I really feel and, you know, the ocean. It's weird. I make that assumption that they're, that they're just talking about my passions as well. And so I relate to Kevin Hart and like I said, Drake a lot in those aspects. Um, my third artist has got to be T-Swift. All right. You know, Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal did her dirty and we all know it. (laughs) But but shout out Jake Gyllenhaal because I love his movies. But wow. still, you got yeah. Those are interesting choices. Yeah, that's just I know. Um, I know that's that's kind of off the. It's just what they stand for is more. T Swift is more of. A, I don't. There's no wrong answer. I don't care what you answer. I'm, I'm curious no, about no. why you answer why you do. I don't feel judgment right now, okay, Rich. I feel a lot of judgment, but I don't feel from you. But yeah, no, T Swift is the reason why is just because of the. I love how she re came out with all of her her old album, and yeah. put her own spin on it now and rebranded it. Marketing genius, absolute marketing genius. I'm waiting for her to sell scarves now, with the whole storyline of Jake Gyllenhaal stealing her scarf. It's a small side man. I talk about fish all day. It's just my brain's fried hilarious uh yeah one of my co-workers is big into taylor swift and so i hear about jake gyllenhaal and the scarf and i have no idea what's going on but hey you know i don't think any of us do but it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's still like i said that storyline and, and back to the kevin hart and, uh mostly the kevin hart stuff is seeing people that really are just on such a trajectory or trajectory of achieving their dream is is what speaks to me it really does. And I, I try to relate that every day thinking you gotta be the hardest worker in the room, especially yeah. if you really care about your, your dream. Yeah, absolutely. So then what's something you're excited about for the next two years? In two years. Oh man. Hopefully she texts me back by then, but yeah, <laughs> in two years. Uh, I'm really, you know what? It's so cliche to say, and I love cliches. I love cliches, dude. But I'm really excited to see where technology is. You know, I, I'm, you know, every time, you know, the Apple watch comes out, I'm like, yo, I want to know what my blood oxygen content is. Hell yeah. Put that <laughs> on my wrist. You know, I, I want to see the new, the new Mac, but also I love hearing or reading papers that use technology in a really unique way, like ROVs and drones, you yeah. know, to, to watch migratory birds right? Or disguising a submersible ROV as a puffer fish to see how dolphins interact with it. Uh, spoiler alert, they're assholes. <laughs> um, see, seeing technology like that expand every year, it seems like it's exponential. It's like compounding. Um, yeah. It's crazy. And I'm, you know, I'm no brainiac. I'm no smarty at the party, but seeing stuff from my perspective and how it's just on this huge arc of just going up teslas you know and like elon my boy stop tweeting but yeah you know my stocks are hurting because of you but i love what you're doing with everything um and so these aspects of technology are what really get me excited uh, for the next two years or you know we're talking about mars 
I'm like, yeah. yo, we, we should look at our own ocean first and then we'll go to Mars, right? But um, another thing I'm really excited about is movies, cinematics, storytelling. Movies. Okay, storytelling. Is, storytelling has just changed so much in even the last year because of COVID. Yeah. You know, we're usually, you know, I'd fly down to Chicago, you know, go to Chipotle, get, get some food down there, go to In-N-Out, maybe five guys. We don't have that, all those stuff here. So that's why I'm saying these things and, and meet you in person. But because of COVID, this is just the norm now. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure the budget isn't there for a Vancouver trip to Chicago, but still, I'm just saying like, it's, uh, I see the cinder blocks in the background, you know, I know it's aesthetic, but I understand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, it, it's just weird how storytelling is now so focused on distance. You know, yeah. we all can't be in the same spot, you know, right now. And telling each other stories is harder than ever. Yet here you are making 200 episodes of podcasts. And yeah. it, I'm loving it. Yeah. I'm loving the the drive you still have. You still make a make your way through it all. You still achieve that goal. You know, nature finds a way. Nature finds, finds a way. way. Yeah. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to go out on. Uh, thanks for joining us, Bryce. This has been a fantastic conversation. I, I enjoyed it so much. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for having me. Like I said, the DM, uh, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, yeah, we're, it's happening. You know, <laughs> I got to get my jokes ready. I got to make sure she doesn't text me back so I can say it. Uh, I ironed the fish shirt out just for you tonight. You know, oh, I'm, I'm, thank you. I, I, I showed up. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.